Welcome to Living Word Ministries with our director and Bible teacher, Debbie Blank. Debbie's passion is for you to understand and apply God's truths to your life. Now let's listen and enjoy teaching from the Word of God with Debbie Blank. The title in my Bible actually has a title for this. It's called a call to worship the Lord, the righteous judge, out of Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Indeed, the Lord is firmly established. It will not be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar and all it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. For he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. Father, this morning we just thank you for the opportunity to come before you to actually ah, give you praise. For your name is above all names. A name that at one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you indeed are Lord of all. Lord, this morning we just ask that you will be with each one of us as we look into this time of Nehemiah, the time of rebuilding the wall around your Jerusalem, rebuilding the wall to protect your temple, to protect worship, to protect your people. Lord, we pray that even now that we will be building our temple to praise you. And we just ask that everything that we say and hear and do this morning be honoring to you, for it's you that we give the praise and glory to. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Did Sandy return? No. Okay. Okay, so, yes, I don't know whether I'm standing or sitting this morning, so this is going to be a problem. Several years ago, I actually had the opportunity to teach these, the lesson last week and the one this week. Debbie must have been in Israel. It's the only thing I can figure out, you know. And so I had difficulty changing my mind for anything. And so what we're going to do, actually, is review this whole thing. The book is divided essentially half and half. This first, yes, oh, never mind. This first half basically is rebuilding the wall. It's reconstruction. And we're going to work our way up into chapter six and seven. And then next week, you're going to go into a new era, a new type of what Nehemiah is going to do now. Now that the wall will be built, what's he going to do? And it's kind of a time of re-instruction. But before we get there, we need to finish building this wall. I don't know if you remember or whatever, what I saw when I was reading through a lot of this. You know, Nehemiah gave us the building of the wall. And you have your pictures, you have this new picture. And it talked about starting with the wall around the temple. And they worked their way around clockwise until they got done. And what it looked like as we read chapter three was like the wall is built. And then we have opposition. I don't see it that way. The opposition occurred while they were building the wall. So chapter three is kind of an outline of what they did and who did it, or a summary of what they did. I think about Genesis one, how God created the earth. 
And then in chapter two, he kind of goes into a little more detail of what that looks like. That's the way I look at these chapters. So we're building a wall. And in this, we have opposition. Anybody got opposition in their lives today? <laughs> oh, -ho. apparently that's not a new idea. So I could have written these down, but I'm not. I actually have them on my notes and then I rewrote everything, you know, it's like, I used a man by the name of Stephen Cole. I like his sermons because he has a really good outline. And that's kind of the way I go. I like somebody else's outline and then I can just fill in whatever. His focus basically is like, you know, when God gives us a purpose, we need to have a common vision in order to complete that. And when you have a vision, first of all, you need a dedicated leader. In this case, that is Nehemiah Wright. And he was, you know, we had, um, we looked at Ezra. Uh, I forgot which chapter that is. I could look back. I don't have that with me. Uh, his characteristics of a godly leader. And Nehemiah shows all those as well. He is dedicated and he is sold out to God. And he's, which is a good thing because he needed to be. One of the things, you know, a good leader is willing to work alongside their people. They don't mind if somebody else gets the credit. Um, I remember my son in the military would, he would much rather take orders from somebody who was above him, but not necessarily the lieutenants or captains, especially the lieutenants. He'd rather have somebody kind of in his category or for sergeants or whatever. Somebody that's been through the trenches, that has experienced life in these situations. Some of these people are coming out of college and they have the title and they have the authority, but they don't have the experience. Nehemiah might have had that experience. At least if he didn't have, he was willing to get his hands dirty and work alongside the people. And that's a big deal with leaders, I think. They have to be able to motivate them. You know, what he did, um, he assigned them a portion of the wall that they would be interested in. Now, if I'm gonna build a wall, I'm more apt to do a good job if I'm in front of my house, right? I don't care really about yours funny story with the covid thing wearing a mask you know how they put my mask protects you and yours protects me yeah it's like if i'm going to wear one i'm wearing it for me what you do is up to you yeah so that was that was actually a good thing on his he started with the priests building around the temple you think they wanted to make sure that the temple was protected? I would hope so. So anyway, he has to plan and organize, and he did that. He established all that around there. Delegate, oversee, give the proper recognition. Think about that. Names are recorded here. We don't know who these people are, but God knows, and he knows your name as well. It's important that we have that we recognize people. And for instance, we see particularly one of the men, and he, he went around and noticed what they were doing. We particularly have this one man, I think his name was Baruch. I have it written somewhere. But he's described as being zealous. So Nehemiah was noticing the people. He was noticing how they work. And God notices you and where your heart is and how you're working for him. You can't do the build the wall by yourself. You need some willing workers. And they were with that. They cooperated with each other and they complimented each other. Think about it. Some were in front of their homes and some people came from outlying cities. Now that's a huge thing to think that people outside your area care about what you're doing. So, and some of them worked outside their area of strength. I think we talked about it. For instance, one of the goldsmiths was willing 
to put in the gate at the dung gate. I'm sure that was not a very glorious job. But what we see is opposition as they were building. As you go back through that chapter, you're going to see that there's a lot of places where they're doing repairs. And then there's other places where they're doing the doors and gates. As we get into chapter 6, you're going to see that the doors and gates were not done at that particular point in time. So these people were building up using what was there that had been burned down there, reestablishing, putting these bricks back together and building up their wall in front of their homes. Opposition that comes, and it comes in a lot of different forms. We're going to see, and I basically I just wrote these all down type thing. Um, where did I go? Anger of others against you out of chapter 4. We saw that Sanballat was angry because they were rebuilding the wall. This was going to probably create some problems for him. Uh, and then he goes into mockery and sarcasm where he says, what are these feeble Jews doing? You know, it's like, do you ever see any of that in your life? Some of these things happen and it's learning to recognize ways that Satan is going to work in your life when you want to do something for God. As children of God, we should always be willing to do something for him, whatever it is, wherever it is. But know that it, you will meet with opposition. It might just be taking your kids to church, you know, seeing that they're there. And that's the morning that people are sick or they can't get dressed in time. Things, you know, you don't know. I mean, things like that happen. This is Satan's way of saying, I don't want you to go. You want to go, but I'm going to make sure that you don't. You know, that's, yeah. But he, at, or get sarcastic about it, you know. What do these people think they're doing after all, you know? Threats and intimidation. We see that in chapter 4 again, verses 8, 11, and 12. 8, they conspired to come and fight and cause a disturbance. Things happen in our lives. I'm not good at illustrations on this apparently today, but that's okay. Negativism, again, verses two, three, and 12 out of chapter four. You know, what are they doing? Are they gonna restore it themselves? You know, he's putting in negative thoughts. Um, sometimes I tend to look at a situation from the what if, I shouldn't go there, but I might tend to look at things from what could possibly go wrong here, you know? Um, just to bring it up, you know, it's like here's something to think about. This could happen. You don't know. And verse 14 out of that, fear. Uh, Nehemiah saw the fear of the people. Fear has, there's different ways that that fear can be being afraid. One of the gals was just telling me this morning, we do need to be mindful of those who perhaps voted opposite of us. That, um, and I don't know how everybody voted here, it's immaterial. The thing is, God raises kings and he can take them down. And for whatever reason, we have oh, former President Trump is going to take over again. Don't know what the future holds. Um, there's a lot of things that could happen. Either way, didn't make any difference who was in office or who's going to be in office. God is still in control. And it's real easy, it's like people have this idea and it maybe doesn't go with what we want. And it's real easy to pray, God, get rid of that type of thing. When in reality, these are real people. They were created in the image of God as well. 
they have lives, they have emotions, and they're, some of them are hurting right now. God's desire is for everyone to come to him. And that's the direction that we need to be praying for ourselves, for our leaders, for those who were in opposition against us, that God would turn their hearts to him. That's just, yeah, a huge way to do all of that, certainly. In verse 10, kind of backing up, they were exhausted and discouraged. And that's probably, if nothing else, that is a big one. It's really easy to get discouraged when you're doing something and you're not seeing any results. Uh, it says, the strength that the burden bears is failing, yet there's much rubbish. We ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. You just get to that point, it's like, what am I doing? I can't do this. Oh. <laughs> Interestingly, I just, now that I'm thinking about it, some of this comes just whatever. Devotional Today by Lisa Turkhurst was a situation where she was faced with something. It's, I can't do this. I can't, I can't. And then she's like, well, maybe you can fix it. So she Googled it. She watched some YouTube videos, and she was able to fix it. And she said, we need to, uh, in our lives, there are times we need to change the I can't to God help me, I can. Um, and this is what they needed right then as well. And certainly with all of that, I have, you know, vigilance, and, oh, that's in the response. Fear was a big one. Fear can be afraid, or as we fear God, we need to revere him, look at him with awe. But I think there's a little bit of being afraid of what God can do because he will discipline us. He brings judgment. We need to remember that God is more than love. He is just, and he will take care of things, certainly. Um, our response, his response in that, basically, pray. Right, okay, a respect. Uh, there's a certain amount of fear with your parents, certainly, sometimes. But you respected them. I hope you respected them. Um, I was kind of reminded the other day, it's like of a situation where uh, and teenagers, you know, they kind of have their own agenda. <laughs> and sometimes it's not always graceful or filled with grace. And uh, a person was disrespected. And I said, you know, I don't remember uh, my mom ever having to tell my grandkids what to do. But I don't think they would have talked back. And my son was sitting next. He said, no, we would not. <laughs> you know, because there was a certain amount of respect and we need to teach our kids, I think, to respect parents and those in authority. We need to respect those in authority, whether we like them or not. God has placed some of these people in positions of authority. And we need to pray, like she said, we need to pray, first of all, that God will get a hold of their heart, that he will direct their words, their actions, to be honoring to him. Their choice, then, is to follow that little voice inside that is saying, this is the way, walk you in it. Anyway, they went to work. We see Nehemiah praying. Oh yeah, this was what I thought about the prayers. You know, sometimes we think, oh, we've got to have an hour to pray. We've got to go into our closet. The Bible does talk about going into your closet. There are times that we need to do in-depth prayer. It also tells us to pray without ceasing. And this is one of those times like in the middle of everything, in the middle of the opposition, as Nehemiah sees what is going on and how the people are being affected by this opposition, he prays, hear how we're despised, return their approach on their own heads, 
give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. He's basically asking God to take care of this situation. You know, in another place he prays, in verse 9 again, we prayed, and because of the, the opposition, we set up a guard. So he took action, saw a problem, prayed about it, took action. And we need to do that as well. And that's the vigilance. We see a lot of that all the way from 14 through 23 out of chapter 4. And he spoke to them and set up, you know, they carried on the work by uh, carrying a sword and still working. Yes, I like this. I had written these down before. Apparently John Bunyan said this about prayer. You can do more than pray after you have prayed. But you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Does that make any kind of sense? I hope so. It wasn't my thought. It was John Bunyan's, okay? You know, prayer kind of reminds us that God is sovereign. He is over all. And he allowed this trial for a reason. They needed to know. I think the people needed to trust their leader, and we definitely see that Nehemiah trusted his God. Uh, anyway, so, and bottom line, he says, focus on the Lord. When I saw their fear, he said, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. So he's saying, he's praying about it again, and they're going to go to work. They're, we see that they... He stands guards and all that, and they are to focus on the Lord. So that's four. We'll turn the page to see what we have here. Oops. I'm, d I'm not good at questions. I'm sorry. Oh, we see some conflict. Oh, yeah, five was that conflict from within. Keep in mind, you know, that up till uh, they're still building this wall. We don't know where they're at in the building of this. But they're being attacked with all kinds of opposition, and they're getting discouraged about this. And then we come into five, and we find that what's happening here is people have probably left their farms and cities to come in and build this wall. And nobody's out here taking care of it, but these other people are still requiring them to pay taxes, and it's becoming quite a burden. And so in the middle of this building business, and restoring the wall, Nehemiah has to take time out and address the situation. Um, and he responds in a biblical way. And that is, we see that uh, a lot of what he did then there made sure that people knew what was going on and they agreed to do all this. And he took care of a lot of these people. He did not take his uh, allotment from the, the king. He paid and took care of people out of his own pocket. Basically, he is working for God's approval. As he ends in verse 19 of chapter 5, remember me again, he's praying again, for good according to all that I have done for this people. So there is uh, a lot going on right here. And now I have an hour to read 6 and 7. So here we go. We'll see where this is going now. Chapter 6. Oh, boy. Now, when it was reported to Sanballat, Tobiah, to Geshem the Arab, I don't know what he's doing there, but he's stuck his nose in this business, and to the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall. Most of the wall has been rebuilt at this point. No breach remained in it, although at that time I had not set up the doors in the gates. Keep in mind that he did ask for and received permission to get timber and stuff to bring that in to build these doors and gates because that probably had actually been burned up when they were taken over. The stones might have still kind of been there. So they've done the repairs in the wall. They're still working on the doors, but they're not done yet. So we're still in this building process. Well, so now we're going to have a new opposition. They call it intrigue. I don't know if that's the word I would have used, but that's beside the point. Sanballat and Geshem sent a message to me saying, Come, 
let us meet together at Sepharim, wherever that is, in the plain of Ono. But they were planning to harm me. So I sent messages to them saying, interestingly enough, you know, he didn't want to go to Oh No. He says, Oh no. <laughs> no. He says, I'm doing a great work. I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Okay. And they sent messages to me four times in this manner. And I answered them in the same way. It's kind of like, what part of no do you not understand? Do you ever say that to your kids? Yes. Oh, my, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, what I tend to do if they wanted something, I said no. They'd ask again, I'd say no. You know, and it, while they're doing this, I might be thinking, you know, I could change my mind. But by the time they get to the third, fourth, and fifth time, it's like, I said no, and I'm not changing my mind. <laughs> it's just not happening. And that, I think that, you know, he probably had a better attitude about it than I did. But he's still saying, I mean, they were persistent. Good grief. But you know what happens? Who's going to be targeted now? The leader. They've been kind of harassing the workers. And that didn't stop the building. So, well, maybe if we take out the leader, they'll stop. Well, yeah fifth time, and the fifth time he comes with an open letter. This is not sealed. It is open for anybody and everybody to read. Yeah, well, that's not great. That's kind of what they call intimidation. Hmm. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Gashmu, now this guy must be really important that we're going to throw his name into the mix, okay? Gashmu says, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. Therefore, you're rebuilding the wall, and you're going to be their king, according to these reports. You've also appointed prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem concerning you. A king is in Judah. And now, I'm going to tattle. Now it will be reported to the king according to these reports. So come now, let us take counsel together. Oh, boy little slander going on here. Let's just throw out some false reports. Oh, I am so glad the election is over. So, you know, they still want to try to meet. I sent a message to him saying, such things as you were saying have not been done. You're inventing them in your own mind. Yes. For all of them, we're trying to, here we go again with the fear, where they're trying to frighten us, thinking they will become discouraged at the work and it will not be done. Short prayer, keeping in mind that he is focusing on God. But now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Strengthen my perseverance. Strengthen me. It's the way I would read that kind of thing. Oh, there are times when we need that, don't we? You feel like I just can't go on. I'm so tired of what's happening around me. I, my life is falling apart. God, I need your strength, for sure. Well then, now we have a new thing. So he enters the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, son of Mehetabel, who was confined at home. We don't know why he was confined at home. Chances are, I mean, he could have been sick, he could have been injured, he could, whatever. But... Um, I don't think so. It's almost like he was deliberately shutting himself away, but that's neither here to there. He was confined at home. So he goes to this guy's house, and um, the Shemaiah basically is saying, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you, and they're going to kill you at night. Huh. But I said, should a man like me flee? And could one such as I go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Keeping in mind, I think it was in, um, I have down Numbers 18.7. I think maybe we actually had to look that one up. 
Uh, somebody else ought to read it because it'll take me a while to find numbers, apparently. Um, which gives the, um, let's see what it says, 18.7. You and your son shall attend to the priesthood for everything concerning the altar and inside the veil, and you are to perform the service. I'm giving you the priesthood as a bestowed service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. This is why I say Nehemiah was probably not a priest. Had he been a priest, he could have gone into the temple. But he didn't go in, right, because... He wasn't going to go in there to hide out. Well, no, any, he couldn't go in at all. Right. Maybe you need a new commentary. <laughs> no, I don't know. But, yeah, he was not going to hide. That is true. That is, we're not going to hide. But he also could not go into this particular place. It was in the temple. And not a priest says he would have been put to death had he gone in there. And he doesn't feel like he should run away either. Then I perceived that God had not sent him. But he uttered his prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Hmm. Those guys have kind of been a thorn in his flesh the whole time, haven't they? They don't want to give up whatever authority they had. And I think they figure that once this wall is built and people move back in, their job and their whatever is going to be gone. They're going to have to, right? <laughs> right. She's saying that, you know, wondering if they were Assyrians, and I don't know. It's very possible that they were part of the people that had been brought in um, during the, when the Israelites when they were taken out and sent to Babylon. So, yeah, he was hired for this reason, that I might become frightened and act accordingly and sin. So they might have an evil report in order that they could reproach me. I think we saw reproach was shaming. Uh, they are trying to take him down any way they can and if they can't get him to quit, we'll just slander him. And we'll cause him to do something that God will take him out. And he knows his God, and he's not going to fall for that. And we, he prays again, remember, oh my God, Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these works of theirs, also Noadiah the prophetess and the rest of the prophets who are trying to frighten me. And that's a way, you know, she says, we need to pray for the salvation of these people, and we do. But it's a matter of handing them over to God. God, you know what they need in their lives. You take care of them. Whatever that might be. Um, because um, it says, remember them according to their works. So the wall was completed on the 25th month of the month Elo in 52 days. Now I'm not good at the calendars and I'm not going to do a calendar. 52 days. That's amazing. And I put in here, you know, exclamation points and praise because this was, that's less than two months to complete this wall because they had a lot of help. When all our enemies heard of it, and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence, for they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Wow. I would like to see that happen in our country. You know, individually and collectively, we need to work, but anything that we accomplish, if it's for God, it will be accomplished by God, um, certainly. Also in those days, many letters went from the nobles of Judah to Tobiah, who apparently was a, I don't know why I have that, Nehemiah 2.10, he was an Ammonite, and Tobiah's letters came to them, to the nobles. For many in Judah were bound by oath to him, because, here now we have infiltration from intermarriage. He was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, 
Era was one that had returned with Zerubbabel, and his son Johanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Moreover, they were speaking about his good deeds in my presence and reported my words to him. Then Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Wow, he's not giving up. You know, he thinks he's got an in because of the intermarriage, you know, and honestly, sometimes that happens in our churches um, that if Satan can't get you out here in the parking lot, he might go to church with you. And he might kind of just sit there and this might be the person that shares a half-truth about something. We recently read a book called Shepherds for Sale. Um, too many of our churches are watering down their message. They're not necessarily presenting the whole truth. And leading people to believe that maybe they're all right, that they don't need to take care of the sin in their life. And uh, I think that's kind of where Tobiah was. I mean, he's still sending letters because there's people there that are intermarried. You know, Ezra got... They sent a lot of those wives and children away, which would have been a hard thing to do. I get that. But this is several years later. Apparently, we're like at 141 years, um, kind of away from everything. I'm not sure what we're away from. I just saw the number. But, uh, you know, you see lives, and times and seasons change. Uh, I think about these people, now that I'm old, I think about these people who are even older and what they've seen through their lifetime. Um, like my mom passed away, what's it been? What did I say, 11 years ago? So she was 89, I think, or would have been. But she lived through the Second World War. I can't imagine what that was like. Um, many of us probably had people or sons, family, husbands, I don't know, went through the Vietnam War. Um, and there's just been things, you know, particularly with my mom, I remember, they had rationing. You could only get so much stuff, you know, sugar and meat and different things. I cannot imagine some of that. We live in a very... Uh, prolific world. It's pretty much anything and everything is available to us. And if you can't afford it, the government will provide it. Um, which is, I'm sure, you know, I've been on that end too, and I appreciate that. But I don't know where you draw the line in helping. How much government do we need? The government is not our savior. Jesus is. And Jesus will provide for us somehow. Um, we don't know how sometimes but you read stories of people needing something and lo and behold an anonymous check comes in the mail or whatever you know I guess if it's a check it's not very anonymous but um, maybe they get the right amount of money somehow um, I love the story that you've probably read many times Somebody was packing a box, you know, in the United States, sending it to a hot country, and they put in a water bottle, a hot water bottle or whatever, you know, and a doll. And lo and behold, when that package finally arrived, there was somebody that needed, they needed that hot water bottle, and there was a little girl that needed that doll. And the package had been sent months before. But somebody was prompted by God to put some of these items in there. Um, I've seen a new deal with the, um, come across my Facebook. This is totally off the mark, I'm sure. But um, in case you do those Christmas shoebox, Christmas shoebox things, 
Apparently, there's a place that you can order shoes that will grow with the kids. I can't tell you how it is. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. But it really, it was like 20 bucks for a pair of shoes. I didn't order any. But I thought that probably wouldn't take up a whole lot of room in that shoe box. You could still, you know. Anyway, um, somebody had a good idea. And they are marketing it and encouraging people to obviously buy that and include it in their shoe box. Because a lot of these, you know, kids, by the time you buy them a pair of shoes, they're out of it already. I think sometimes I had to buy shoes like every three months for some of the kids. And it's like, what? And one of them didn't, couldn't do the cheap shoes. That's always hard, too, you know. Anyway, sorry. That was a big detour. Anyway, maybe, because I didn't want to read all these names in chapter 7. But that's beside the point. Anything you want to comment before we get into chapter 7 with all of these names? Oh, yes. She's talking about shedding of incident blood, which we're not necessarily seeing that in Nehemiah, but today we are in the abortion thing, certainly. Um, having had a couple miscarriages myself, you know, all I can think about with all these aborted babies is God's got an incredible crowd waiting to come back with him. Because I, I totally believe that's where they're all at. Satan hasn't thought about that. He's just trying to get rid of the population, you know, and creating problems in people's lives. I cannot imagine. I think about, oh, I don't know what I would do in the, we're detouring again, sorry. If some of these women have carried, you know, and some of this isn't discovered until 20 weeks that they're carrying a child that's not going to live. And they're being recommended to terminate. And I don't know what I would do. I have basically you know, an acquaintance who gave birth to a trisomy 18. The child lived, I think, a few days. She still, many years later, is grieving the loss of this child. And I get that. You would. But I, I wonder, you know, would she have terminated if it had been available? I don't know. I used to see women in the NICU who perhaps had had scheduled abortions. They're pregnant again, and now this baby is coming early. And they are all about you saving this baby. And it's like, somehow there's a disconnect here between what you did with these other pregnancies and how you are hanging on to this one. I appreciate you wanting to hang on to this one, but where were you, you know, where was your thinking back then? But that's just me, that's just what I think, you know, and it's like, anyway, we did save lots of those babies. Um, and um, I remember one story, it was interesting. Um, I think the baby was probably around 24, maybe, maybe 25, most likely 24 weeks. Family decided that I think she needed to be delivered. They decided that they uh, were just gonna let the baby go. They weren't gonna try to resuscitate and try to do all that. So she goes off to the baby is left in the resuscitation room because they didn't figure, you know, it's hard for a 24-weeker to breathe on their own. They, they, they can for a little while. And the doctor walked by and he hears this baby crying. And he comes into the NICU and he's like, you gotta go get that baby because he's still, he's determined he's gonna live. So we had to resuscitate and live and they, they you know, they fell in love with their baby and took him home and everything, you know, but it's like, it was, it was an interesting situation where they were choosing to just let nature take its course. But this little boy said, no, 
you know, and honestly, those little ones are the feistiest little kids. It's amazing how much fight these little 23, 24, 25 weekers can have. They don't like wet pants, and they will really pitch a fit when, you know, yeah. They're intubated, you can't hear them cry, but by golly, they could show what they're thinking. Anyway, that was a detour. I don't know why we got there, other than I'm filling up time. Anyway, are we ready to look at chapter seven? Okay. Now when the wall was rebuilt, and I had set up the doors, and the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed, then I put Hanani, my brother, now this is the man who brought him the news to start with, you know, back in chapter one, what's going on in Jerusalem? And he says, well, the walls are broken down, you know. And that's what started Nehemiah's concern and prayer and how Debbie made the comment. He prayed for four months. Anyway, and then Hananiah, the commander of the fortress in charge of Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God more than many. So what we're doing here, put the gatekeepers, the singers, the Levites, he's establishing protection, but he's also reestablishing worship. Keep in mind, worship matters to God. Hmm. It says, if you want your life to count, grow as a worshiper. Well... And two, the other thing, is godly character matters to God. See how he describes Hananiah. He's a faithful man, and he fears God more than many. Oh, are we faithful? How much do we fear God? God can change your character. I think there will be things that we'll kind of always have, but there are things. You should never hold someone's character against them because God, God can change them. Nehemiah begins his prayer always focusing on God and praising God and recognizing who he is. We need to, our lives need to do that as well in our prayer time in just the way we live. And it says, you know, the godly character then matters, you know, too. Um, then I said to them, he's going to start giving them some orders kind of thing. Do not let the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun is hot. And while they are standing guard, let them shut and bolt the doors. Also appoint guards from the inhabitants of Jerusalem, each at his post and each in front of his own house. And that was an interesting thing. They're not going to, op used to open at sunrise and close at sunset. Okay. Now we have to sit. Um, he wants the sun to be, he wants it up and he wants people good and awake. Doesn't really say when they close them. Other than, it just says, they're to shut and bolt the doors. And it's like, I'm not really sure how long they were open. Interesting, I didn't, I only found it in one Bible. I must have been reading it was a New Living Study Bible. Made it sound like the gates were only to be open while the sun was really hot. So like apparently from like 10 to noon or something like that. I would think here it'd be more like noon to 2 o'clock maybe or whatever. So we don't really know how long they were open other than they weren't going to be open at sunrise. We're not going to, we're going to make sure people are good and awake before we open these doors. But when they're shut, they're going to be bolted shut and have guards. Yes. It needed to be open, certainly, and they would, you know, it's, it had doors. Right. Yeah. Now, the city was large and spacious, but the people in it were few, and the houses were not built. So, you know, uh, people matter about God. Then my God, yeah, then my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the people to be enrolled by genealogies. Then I found the book of the genealogy of those who came up first, in which I found the following record. 
at which point we will begin reading all of these names. Uh, it is very similar, a lot of the same people, because it is the, the list basically from Ezra. Uh, some of the numbers are different. There's some names that might be missing. We don't know exactly why. Never found a really good reason other than it could have been scribal error uh, at that time. Don't know. Uh, but apparently the final total all matched. So here we go. Maybe we just, I'm going to detour here a little bit. I have characteristic of faithfulness, basically. We talked about Hananiah being faithful and uh, godly character, and that's something we need to be reliable and truthful, firm. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit, and it shows that we uh, walk in dependence on the Holy Spirit. That's what faithful means trusting God. Um, one of the devotional ladies uh, that I read, her phrase is, and she uses it forever, God is sovereign and you can trust him. And that was a conclusion she had. I think she had it, but when her 16-year-old son, her youngest, was killed in a car accident, she went through major despair and depression and kind of wondered where God was. And she's written a book about it. It took her a long time uh, to get over that. And But in all her writings, she attributes people coming beside her, walking her through her grief, walking alongside, knowing that... Uh, and she really had to struggle. She struggled with this trust and being faithful, but she knew her God, and people would direct her back. Her husband would direct her back to Scripture. That's where you're going to get it. God's Word is going to lead you when the despair hits, but you've got to get in it. How to dis develop faithfulness. Recognize and define responsibilities that God has given you to do. Uh, spiritual gifts, we're all given one, at least one. Uh, how do we use it? Do we use it? And they're all important. They might be like Debbie, up here teaching every week, leading teams to Israel, running a ministry. She's on the radio. She writes books. And then there's the people that work in the kitchen, and they are just as important because food is important. Yeah. I like food. I think we all like food, and, you know, those people that are willing to work out there and make the coffee and fix the food and see to all of that are just as important because Debbie can't do this unless the rest of us are doing what God has called us to do. My daughter, one of them, says she believes that God has given her an incredible gift of faith, and she does. She's been praying over people at her work, and they's like, well, you need you to pray because things will happen. She says, it's not me, it's God. But she's willing to pray with them right in the moment. It's not one of those, well, I'll pray for you, and then you walk out the door, and maybe you remember to pray for them. She prays for them on the spot, and they're have actually seen God answer those prayers, sometimes within moments or hours. Um, but we all have a gift. Whatever your gift is, whether it's service or teaching or helps, that's service, discernment, whatever it is, exercise it under God's control. Be faithful. Recognize who you are in Jesus Christ. You know, don't neglect the small things. Keep your relational priorities straight. Who's first in your life? Jesus? Your family? Your job? Your electronics? Got to keep our priorities straight. Oh, learn to use your time more efficiently, effectively. I'm not using my time very effectively at home at all. I need to be more proactive in that. Uh, 
fear of God. That's the other thing that Fan and I had. He was faithful and he feared God. What's your relationship with God? Do you fear him? Do you revere him? Do you respect him? Or are you afraid of what he might do to you? God loves you, but he's also not going to tolerate sin in your life. He will find a way to purge that out of your life. And it might be through some type of a, I don't know, circumstance or some sort. You know, we never know how God is going to work in our lives to draw us closer to him. You know, a lot of times, the deeper you grow with God is when you're in the valley and things are tough. And it's like you have nowhere to go but to God. And he's right there with you. One of my favorite names for God is Emmanuel, God with us. Through thick and thin, God will be there. So we read the names. These are the people of the province who came up from the captivity of the exiles whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, each to his city who came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramah, Naham, Nahamani, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nahum, Bena. The number of men of the people of Israel, the sons of Perish, 2,172. The sons of Shephatiah, 372. The sons of Era, 652. The sons of Peath, Moab, of the sons of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. The sons of Elam, 1,254. The sons of Zatu, 845. The sons of Zachai, 760. Golly, we have another whole page. The sons of Benui, 648. The sons of Bebai, 628. The sons of Asgad, 2,322. The sons of Adonikam, 667. The sons of Bigvi, 2,067. The sons of Aden, 655. The sons of Adar of Hezekiah, 98. The sons of Hashem, 328. The sons of Bazai, 324. The sons of Haraf, 112. The sons of Gibeon, 95. The men of Bethlehem and Nedophim, 188. The men of Anatoth, 128. The men of Beth Azmath, 42. The men of Kiriath Jerem, Shephir and Birith, 743. The men of Ramah and Geba, 621. The son of Michmas, 122. The men of Bethel and Ai, 123. The men of the other Nebo, 52. The sons of the other Elam, 1,254. The sons of Haram, 320. The men of Jericho, 345. The sons of Lod, Hadad, and Ono, 721. The sons of Sina, 300,930. Now we're going to see we've seen sons and men and, you know, families here. Priests, the priests, the sons of Jediah, the house of Jeshua, 973. The sons of Emmer, 1,052. The sons of Pasher, 1,247. The sons of Haram, 1,017. Levites, we need those. The Levites, the son of Jeshua, of Cadmiel, the sons of Hodavah, 74. We need singers, the sons of Asaph, 148. The gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Ader, the sons of Talman, the sons of Akab, the sons of Athita, the sons of Shobai, 138. Oh, we need some animals. Their horses were 736, their mules, 245, their camels, 435, their donkeys, 6,720. You know, and it's like your place in God's family history matters to God. We need to know that we've been born spiritually through faith in Jesus Christ, know the promises, and see evidence that God has changed your heart, and then pass the torch. Are you passing the torch? You know, a lot of this has been focusing on Nehemiah as a leader, and I don't want you to say, oh, I'm not a leader, because I think we all are. Many of you have been teachers, mothers. Even if you're not married, you've probably had contact with children and other women. You are mentors to somebody. You are leaders. And we all need to be following this. Yes. Okay, we're going to read verse 46. I jumped from 45. My page was upside down. I jumped from 45 to 68. And I missed a whole lot of people. And we want to be sure. Because God knows their names. He knows your name. And now we're going to see these people. We don't necessarily have numbers, like she said. Okay. So anyway, wow. That's okay. I get to read some more names. Isn't that fun? 
well, okay. The temple servants, the sons of Ziha, the sons of Hasufa, the sons of Taliath, the sons of Keros, the sons of Sia, the sons of Paden, the sons of Obana. These are all temple servants now. Uh, sons of Hagabah, the sons of Shalmai, the sons of Hanan, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of Riah, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nakoda, the sons of Gazim, Uzzah, Pasea, the sons of Besiah, and Nephesh, whatever. The sons of Barak, Bug, the sons of Hakufa, the sons of Harbor, the sons of Mesela, the sons of Mahita, the sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Sisera, the sons of Tema, the sons of Neziah, the sons of Hatifa, the sons of Solomon's servants now, the sons of Sotai, the sons of Sophra, the sons of Harita, the sons of Jela, the sons of Darkon, the sons of Gedel, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hadal, the sons of Pokereth, Hazabim, well, that's quite a name, the sons of Ammon, all. So there, we have all these, been, see here's where it lists them now. All the temple servants and the sons of Solomon servants were 392. So we do have a number. We just had to read all the names. I would have been happy with just verse 60. <laughs> these were they who came up from Telmila, Telharsha, Sherab, Adon, and Emmer. Oh, but now see. They could not show their father's houses or their descendants whether they were of Israel. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, the sons of Nakoda, 642. They weren't able to show that they belonged there. Of the priests, the sons of Hobiah, the sons of Hakos, the sons of Barzillai, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was named after them. These searched among their ancestral registration, but it could not be located. Therefore, they were considered unclean and excluded from the priesthood. So these were some of the priests. They, they couldn't do that. The governor said to them that they should not eat from the most holy things until a priest arose with Urim and Thummim. The whole assembly together was 42,360. Besides their male and their female servants, of whom there were 7,337, and they had 245 male and female servants. Sir, singers. So we see that people matter to God. The records were important in this case, and that's probably why we have genealogies and stuff all the way through here. Uh, we needed to prove that keeping all these, ultimately that we get then into the New Testament, the records were important to prove that Messiah actually descended from Judah and David. Individuals you, as an individual, are important to God. He knows your name. And he, yeah, he knows all his people by name and makes sure he knows your name. Families are important to God. You know, um, and men. Women are also important, but the Bible elevates men, women to a status unknown to other religions. Interesting. But the hierarchy of roles in the family and in the church if Satan cannot break up a home through divorce, his next tactic is to get the men to be passive. If Satan cannot break up a home through divorce, his next tactic is to work on the men to get them to be passive and not involved. We need our men to be involved. Um, so we'll skip the horses, the animals. But, okay. Now we're going to give to the work. As Kurt says, yeah, you knew I was going to talk about money. Yeah, well, you know, money's important. And God expects us to give back just even a small amount of what he has given to us. It's not exactly what this says, but some of them generously did. They gave from among the, some from among the heads of father's households, gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury a thousand gold drachmas, fifty basins, five hundred and thirty priest garments. Some of the heads of father's households gave into the treasury of the work twenty thousand gold drachmas and two thousand two hundred silver minas. I did not look up the equivalent of any of that. That which the rest of the people gave was twenty thousand gold drachmas and two thousand silver minas and sixty seven priest garments. Now the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants and all Israel lived in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel 
were in their cities. God's, you know, God's purpose is to be glorified among the nations. So each of us is unique. God has a different role for each of us to fulfill. We're to discover who we are in Christ. If you have an opportunity to do a spiritual gift test, that'd be a good way. And look for places that you can serve in your church, in your home, in your community. Commit yourself fully to be all that God wants you to be. Jim Elliott was one who said, wherever you are, be all there. So here we have it. Any other comments and questions? I do have a song such as it is. Yeah, anybody? Are we okay with where we went today? Opposition and circumstances sway him in where he was going, what, he, what his vision was. Um, he was given a job and he intended to do it not for his sake, but for the glory of God. And we saw this in the building that all this opposition came in basically while they're in, it happened during chapter three as you see the people building. They did not build this without opposition. We don't live our lives without opposition by any means. So I was going to do a very simple song today, but I heard this one, hadn't heard it for years. Uh, my son's been driving us to church and he apparently cannot drive unless he has music on. <laughs> now I would just as soon not listen to some of his music because what he really likes is hard rock. But he does have some other playlists, which is really nice. And so this one played Sunday. So here we go. Let's see what I can do with it. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. These are the days of great trials of famine and darkness and sword. Still, we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And these are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding the temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest. I think I'm missing something here. Anyway. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. There is no God like Jehovah. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet's call. Lift your voice. It's the year of jubilee, for out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Lord, we thank you for this day, for this message, for seeing and learning about how it, what it means to be sold out for you, to take a job that you have assigned to us and do it wholeheartedly and not allowing ourselves to be distracted by Satan's means of opposition through false, te false teachings, false lies, false lies. Lies are always false. For slander, for discouragement, Lord, help us to remember to rely on you, to call out to you even when things are hard, and Lord, give me strength to complete the job you've given to me to do. Lord, I pray that you will be with each one of us as we go today that we might search our hearts and see what you're calling us to do and that we might answer your call and go about it wholeheartedly. For it's in your name we pray, the name of Jesus. There is nothing better than the name of Jesus. There is just something about your name. And it's in that name we give you all the praise. Amen. 
Thank you for joining Living Word Ministries. Living Word Ministries is a viewer-supported program. Please visit www.livingwordministry.org for more Bible studies and information. And please join us again for Living Word Ministries.